Welcome to the Cross Border <laughs> Interviews with it. Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to welcome back a guest on the show from January because we thought, why not talk about conservative politics with someone who is going through the exact same thing here in Canada as well as his home country of the United Kingdom. There is currently a leadership race for the United Actually, it's not the United. It's the Conservative and Unionist Party of the United Kingdom, because that's the name of their party. Uh, There's a leadership race that is going to effectively become the next leader of the uh, Conservative Party, but also the next prime minister. And we want to bring on our our friend of the show, a great podcast as well, the host of the Partly Political Broadcast, Tiran Duab. Taryn, thank you so much for doing this. That was a very long-winded uh, introduction to say, <laughs> thanks for doing this, man. <laughs> it was great. No, well, it's, it, it's lovely to be back. Thank you for, for having me on. Um, and also, I'm, I'm really impressed that you did the full title of Conservative and, and Unionist Party, which no one here says, mainly because everyone in Scotland and Wales hates them and in Northern Ireland. So the idea that they're any sort of Unionist Party is hilarious. But, but I, I, you know, I, I love how much, uh, you know, you've, you've got your research. Well, I, I need to mine, say conservative so. and unionist, because if I say just conservative party, someone in Canada is going to be like, these people aren't running for the conservative party leadership, because here in Canada, sure. the federal conservative party is also going through a massive leadership race right now, which is going to be ending in September, which I believe the uh, leadership race over in the United Kingdom is also ending in September. Or that's mm-hmm. when the voting is going to be conducted. But I want to talk about the lead up, because For those who don't remember, (laughs) Darren and I talked back in January and we talked about this guy who was called Teflon Man, who could not do anything wrong. And it seemed like he was cruising to just run out 2022. And that's Boris Johnson. But in June, there was a confidence vote and he survived that confidence vote. But weeks later, he resigned as prime minister of the United Kingdom. Let's talk about the lead up before we talk about the candidates. What happened? Because I'm looking over here going, if you survive a confidence vote, you think you would have the confidence of the party. Yeah, I mean, it, it's. Uh, I love that you say the lead up, and really, we need to sort of go back six years, seven years for a proper lead up, don't we? <laughs> but we haven't got time for that. Um, what's What's weird is so this particular, the particular incident that supposedly took him down. But let's be honest, it was it was many things. It, it was uh, that there was an MP called Chris. I mean, so this is hilarious. There's an MP that's accused of, of sexual harassment, and his name is genuinely Chris Pincher. Chris Pincher. His name is Pincher. He was a. I mean, it it just it writes itself. But he as a comedian, he, he must he just a, love he, that. <laughs> Well, at the same time, you sort of feel like, oh, you've done my job already. I don't know what's left for me. Um, but he had many sexual harassment allegations, but he also had a position in the cabinet um, as a, a, a deputy. I, I can't remember the proper title. Deputy chief officer of the cap. Something that doesn't really make sense when you read it. And uh, but he was in charge of, again, considering what he was accused of, he was in charge of whipping the other MPs to take part in votes. And um, and all the allegations came out that uh, he sexually harassed other MPs. And um, and Boris Johnson denied all knowledge and said, oh, we didn't know about that when we hired him to the cabinet. But then it turned out they absolutely did and they absolutely didn't care. And that, I mean, th- but this is like a long build up because that was the point that they decided, that other Conservative MPs decided, this is when we should probably take him down. This is when we should turn against him. Uh, and Conservative MPs, um, first of all, sort of started to, come out they started to resign they had the chance to resign you had the health secretary resign saying they no longer had faith in the government all the all the polls i should say were terrible the conservatives were really losing and um, then after their mother conservatives and eventually he lost something ridiculous it was like 58 ministers in his cabinet resigned which is the most ever um and then he kind of had no choice but had to go but he hasn't gone he's still there <laughs> he's still there and he's still there till september till they choose a new leader and he's now just pissing about in army gear and like having parties and going on holiday and doing absolutely nothing about the myriad of crises that we're having in the country so he's not gone yet he's still being awful um and it very much looks like the person that will succeed you know it will be his successor was someone who massively adored him and worked in his cabinet and will carry on doing exactly the same crap so it's all it's all nonsense and also you know these sexual harassment allegations which which are awful and and you know rightly so it should be a resigning reason but it's weird that that's when everyone got their um 
you know, all their statements about this country needs to have dignity and you know, this party needs to be honest. And it's like, you haven't, you haven't said that about all the other things, you know, all the dodgy donations, all the meetings with sort of Russian representatives, all the, uh, you know, the, the parties at Downing the Queen, Street, proroguing parliament, <laughs> the parties at Downing Street. It's, it's endless. The list of awful things they've done is endless. And it was suddenly that one that we did, oh, we have to be uh, honest and be honest with the public. <laughs> oh, sure, sure, mate, of course. You know, were you visited by ghosts last night or something? Is that what happened? So, you know, uh, ridiculous. So one of the things that I, from an observer outside the country, and this is just a, a political observer of different uh, countries around the world, um, during this whole time, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister of the if Scotland, announced that we're going to a referendum. Was there any play into that as well? Because here in Canada, people were saying if Boris Johnson was prime minister of Can uh, the United Kingdom during that referendum, Scotland would leave no matter what. Or did that have nothing to play on this, do you think? Um, I, I don't, do you know what, I, I mean, I don't think it helped, but I don't think it would have played, but mainly because, and this is awful, right, because uh, uh, in, in a way, I, I massively support Scottish independence, because I think just, just sever the place at the border, float off, join Scandinavia, have a much better time. <laughs> but the, the thing is, is English people, and particularly English Conservatives, don't care about Scotland in the slightest. This was very much, I, nobody has a say in this except the Conservatives, right? So in this decision, getting rid of Boris Johnson, the people that decided that were the Conservative Party. It didn't matter what the public thought. It didn't matter what, I mean, the opposition did nothing, but even if they had done, no one was doing anything except the Conservatives. They decided this is the best chance, um, particularly Rishi Sunak, who's one of the contenders, to make a power grab. This It was a good time. The, the polls were at their lowest. Um, and so, and, and it's the same again, you know, nobody really has a choice in who the next leader is, apart from 160,000 Conservative voters who are Conservative Party members. It's decided by such an incredible small amount of people uh, because we live in a democracy <laughs> well in Canada we're going through the exact same thing here in the province of Alberta uh, the conservative uh, government is currently without a leader well they have a leader the premier stepped down because of his handling of COVID-19 and restrictions and not restrictions we always uh, uh, we, we call ourselves the Texas of, uh, of Canada because we are very uh, conservative in our viewpoints um, and then here in Canada also federally the conservative party is going through this as as well and we we are having the same issue there's such a small amount of people whether it be 100,000 whether it be 75,000 people who are going to decide a the next premier of Alberta but also the next leader of the conservative party but ultimately the next prime minister of Canada if Justin Trudeau resigns or fails to win the next election um what's the what's the engagement like in uh, the UK right now for the leadership race we'll talk about the candidates in a few minutes but are people engaged are people buying memberships do you have to buy a membership like talk me through the political process of the leadership uh, vote if, if that makes sense um you do you do have to buy a membership I don't think people particularly want to uh, I mean the, the Tory party is generally very very rich uh, donors to the party that tends to be the membership it tends to be people in the southeast particularly sort of of the baby boomer age and w with a fair amount of money that tends to be the, the majority of, of members um people are engaged mainly because we've sort of been forced to be it's been there's been a lot of televised debates for a, a, a for a thing that we can't vote in for a race that we can't vote in um but but people here are, people here are terrified right now and i i, I don't put, say that lightly we've got um I mean, much like the rest of the world, climate change crisis, we're about to have a, a, a and I know we laughed about this before we recorded, we're about to have a second heat wave uh, in the UK this week, which for the rest of the world isn't that hot. I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, I never remember. It's, it's going to be about 34, 35 degrees this week, it's Celsius, and it was about 40 degrees Celsius a couple of weeks ago. But for the UK, that's horrendous. None of our homes are insulated probably. We don't have air con, not all the train tracks melt, all the all the, all the the tube train becomes unbearable. But it's, it's all the hospitals don't run properly, everything's terrible. Um, so we've got that. We've got our electricity bills are going to go to the, the cap keeps rising every three months. So they're reckoning by January, people are going to have to pay 350 to 400 pounds a month for energy, which is about 600, 700 Canadian dollars, I think. Uh, NHS have got a two year waiting time for even minor operations. We've got water shortages. So it's like crisis on crisis, crap. petrol is extortionate. And, and, and I think we're, we're sort of heading towards what might be a general strike. We've got railway workers on strike. NHS workers are planning to go on strike. Teachers are planning to go on strike. 
strike. Uh, Royal Mail workers are planning to go on strike. BT, uh, British Telecom workers have gone on strike. So like all these, because all their pay, they've had like, real time pay cuts and cost of living keeps rising, inflation keeps rising. So everyone's terrified and livid. And what we've got is two possible leadership contenders who are both saying they'll do absolutely nothing about any of those things and are instead focusing on taking us out of the European Court of Human Rights so they can deport people more easily. And that seems to be their main. <laughs> so they're, they're playing to a very small audience and the rest of the country, even people like, you know, who, who say they voted Conservative before are, are going, just can you sort out this because we're all very scared um and they can't sort it out because they're useless and they keep saying the country's in a critical situation and we need to fix it it's like y you did it you did that that you you've done this <laughs> it was the government you were part of so let's talk about the it's leadership incredible. candidates right now because there's the so originally at the beginning of this uh, whole uh, race they started with eight candidates and in the united kingdom uh conservative party vote leadership method the the MPs decide who the final two are by a round of ballots, secret ballots, if I'm not mistaken, and the uh, last two standing go to the membership of the party if there are two standing, which if I'm not mistaken, Theresa May did not have to go to the membership. She was just a mm -hmm. claimed by the MPs where Boris Johnson yeah. and Jeremy Hunt went to the membership because they were the last two standing. Here in 2022, we have two uh, candidates left and they are the former chancellor of the exchequer rishi sunak i apologize if i pronounce that first name wrong yep. and then i'm gonna get this title wrong because it's a very convoluted title for a ministry but secretary of state for foreign commonwealth and development affairs which i'm pretty sure just means secretary of foreign affairs but in britain you have to extend everything i believe yep. um liz truss so let's start with sunak who is that to the people who do not follow politics like you and i do all right, sure. Well, uh, Rishi Sunak, he's been Chancellor uh, under Boris Johnson. So when did he become Chancellor? In 2019. Um, he is a multimillionaire who is married to a billionaire who has more money than the Queen. Um, his his wife uh, and her family are incredibly, incredibly rich. And he owns many houses. And he actually spent quite a bit of time living in America uh, with a, a US visa. Um, and his wife was a non-dom tax exile and didn't pay tax at all in the UK. And she paid money in order to avoid it. Um, and Rishi Sunak for a while was headed, a lot of the, the, the sort of press were really heading him as kind of, they called him Dishy Rishi because they said he was, he was really like sexy and cool. And he, he's like this new chancellor and he's going to, uh, you know, definitely be a leader in the future. Um, but then the tax exile stuff really hit him. Also, a lot of his decisions during the pandemic were, terrible um one of his main campaigns was um basically to give people 10 pounds off eating in restaurants like nando's or pizza hut at the time when the pandemic was really high and he was encouraging people to go out and get money off to save the restaurants um he then told everyone they had to go back to work when the pandemic was really high he basically had a lot of decisions that encouraged people to die and then he uh and then he also lost 11 billion pounds of uh money to fraudulent covid claims that he just hasn't bothered to reclaim and instead he's insisted on raising taxes and taking the money off people so he's he's not very popular um he had a little period of being popular and i think that's that's turned on him that turned on him quite quickly a few months ago um so, so yeah, just I, just for clarification and this is just for my listeners but also mm -hmm. for myself chancellor of the exchequer basically means that you're the money guy right you present the budgets you do the whole yeah. tax and spend right so the equivalent yeah. to canada would be the minister of finance for those canadians listening going what does the chancellor of exchequer mean that seems <laughs> like a fancy title well basically you 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 are the right hand man or woman to uh the prime minister you sit in number 11 downing street instead of number 10 downing street that's what i learned from yes minister everyone <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. See, yes, Minister was. I mean, it's such a great program. Such a great program. Um, and then and Liz Truss. As well. yeah. Liz Truss. So I'm an outsider here. And this is just, mm. this is just my uh, opinion of her. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Marie Penn in, uh, in France, very right wing, mm. ran against uh, Marc on, uh, Emmanuel Macron in the last presidential election. You have Donald Trump. Rick De, uh, DeSantis in Florida. You have people like Pierre Polyev in Canada who are more the populist right wing, where it seems like Sunak is more of the traditional conservative in the 
words of traditional conservatives, conservatism, but Truss seems more of a populist conservative. Is that right? Yeah, it's close. I mean, I'd say Sunak is not, he, he sort of is, but he isn't in that like he wants to raise taxes and he's a lot of his financial decisions have annoyed traditional conservatives. However, Liz Truss is very much uh, a populist. Um, I mean, you know, she was anti Brexit and then Brexit happened and then she was super pro Brexit. And, and even in fact, actually, as a good example, this week she made a big announcement about how if she was prime minister, she'd cut public sector workers pay everywhere except the southeast of England. And then within an hour, after realizing everyone said that was horrendous, um, said, uh, oh, I, I never said that. And I've been misrepresented, even though it was in all her print and all of her copy. And that was never what I meant. And she does that constantly. So she just wants to be prime minister. I, it's really difficult to tell how, uh, you know, really what her politics are, because she doesn't hold them for more than five minutes. She will change to whatever makes her seem popular. Um, she is, I, it's, it's, I, I, I try not to say this about people, but I genuinely think she's an incredibly stupid human being. <laughs> I think there's this footage of her at her campaign launch coming off stage and then getting lost in the room that she's in. And it and it sort of sums her up really well. <laughs> she just she's very much about where can I have a lovely picture taken for Instagram and then not having a clue about anything else. She is really terrible. And and at the moment, her and Rishi Sunak just seem to be having like a populism race. They're just trying to beat each other with the most horrific thing that they can say. The, the most awful thing that they can cut, destroy, <laughs> change. So it's all like, we'll deport even more people. We'll lower it so businesses don't pay any tax. We'll take us out of the human rights court. You know, we'll cut of, we'll cut all the health and safety regulation. And it and it just seems to be like a kind of top Trumps of uh, probably emphasis on the Trump bit of that, of, of who can be the most right wing. And uh, it's quite, I mean, I suppose the only thing that I have hope for is knowing that, you know, based on their records so far, that they may not, actually end up carrying out anything they say now because they seem to have failed on all their promises while they're in government so maybe that's the hope but yeah it's very i was going to say it was a lovely quote i mean and and it feels very odd to say it's a lovely quote this is from a russian um minister who i mean you wouldn't ever say a lovely quote really it's from uh lavrov <laughs> what's his you you'll know better than me lavrov's position um and i wouldn't normally quote him in, from peter's government but he said when he had to talk to liz trust that it was like a mute person speaking to a deaf one and i always thought that was <laughs> that was quite incredible <laughs> i'd never quote him normally but god damn that was uh yeah so <laughs> Let, let's I'm going to ask the million dollar question here, because I think this is where we're going to start on this conversation, even though we've been talking for about 20 minutes, 10 minutes already. Who's the heir apparent? Because we always look at politics as who's the next right in Canada. We always look mm -hmm. at, OK, we had Stephen Harper, the last conservative prime minister. Who's the heir apparent to the conservative movement to win them back power? In uh, in the UK, you've had four prime ministers in six years. You've had David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, and soon to be the next, whoever it may be, Truss or Sunak. Who's the heir apparent to the Johnson dynasty? Or are people looking for something different from the Johnson dynasty? And I say dynasty as no. in like whatever length he was in power there, two years. Two, yeah, two, two and a bit years. Yeah, and he, um, it, it's... It's weird because it's, it, I mean, arguably, even though he's not done a very good job so far and has led to everything, people should think that Rishi Sunak knows more about finances. And we're heading into a recession. We're having a terrible economic crisis. Um, and and arguably, I say arguably, it, the recession has happened under his <laughs> time as chancellor. So, and he's clearly been terrible. But but it looks like Liz Truss is in uh, the more favourable. And you could say that's because a lot of Conservative Party members wouldn't like the idea of an Asian man as prime minister in Britain. Um, you could say that. It could also be that she is absolutely a big fan of Boris Johnson and has said that she'd have him in her cabinet if she got into power. Um, she hasn't sort of... Um, deny that she might do that so there's a lot of supporters of him that would you know this is the next best thing if they can't have him back and a lot of people did just want him to not to take back his resignation um that they'll just really her who will be yeah yeah which is yeah what? because they think he's popular and charming and that he won this amazing vote in 2019 that, that no one thought he, well it, everyone thought he was going to win because it was all about brexit and and nothing else you know so it's they've got these delusions about how powerful he or how brilliant he is but i mean publicly he's been hated now for a good year or so now is that just hated yeah, in downtown london where you are like in the london outskirts the suburbs no. of london or is that like uh in uh 
Scotland up in uh, Newcastle upon Tyne uh, over in uh, well well I was gonna say Welsh but that's the I can't even think of the name Welsh no Wales <laughs> yeah no Wales, wow Wales and Scotland have always hated him uh, okay Wales and Scotland have always always hated him um the uh no the, around the country people I mean there's always been a weird divide in that cities tended to go for sort of more left wing and and outside of cities tend to be more right wing that's been the general divide in this country for many many years um and uh but J- boris johnson's popularity especially after the party gate stuff which is when which is when we spoke we spoke in january and we we're talking about the fact that he had all these parties during covid um and he largely got away with them and it looks like he may he's currently being persuaded that if he can give up being an mp then he won't get investigated for party gate at all by the internal affairs committee um so but and, and that will also trigger a by-election for his whoever succeeds him which then means they could lose another seat so it's quite nasty uh, internally but but um he, all of that really put people off him massively that they knew he was breaking the rules when when they weren't um and his popularity started dropping then and then they kind of kept dropping with each and everything that that came out that he'd done <laughs> so it's it's um you know and especially that the big the big win for the conservatives in 2019 was an area that, that's known as the red wall and it's um it was known as that which is i mean it's a bit ridiculous because it's not really a thing but there are a series of seats in the north part of england that were traditionally labor seats right so yep. that's the opposition party and in 2019 a lot of them went conservative now if you were actually to look at the stats they were all turning more conservative since tony blair in the two 2000s and have been ever since they felt he didn't represent them and it all kind of changed um but that was the big election where they all changed and now most of those seats are anti-conservative again they all hate Boris Johnson. like if you all the polling for them is really really angry because they haven't seen any investment in there is they haven't seen this leveling up which is the phrase that was used quite often and uh, they're all seeing cuts in their pay while cost of living goes up you know so the reality is really crashing down on everything I'm not saying there aren't people that still support him or because there are, there always are. But generally, um, it really feels like re- they can't really deal with the reality of, of what a lot of their decisions have, have kind of landed up with. So there's one person I've, I've been trying to figure out what's on their mind right now. And that is Theresa May. <laughs> like if you were Theresa May right now, who was ousted by Boris Johnson because of her handling of uh, Brexit, what would you be? What, what like? What what's she doing these days? I know she's a backbencher. She's not in cabinet. She's just basically a stateswoman in the House of Commons. I watched the uh, Prime Minister's question period from time to time. I saw her attack on Boris Johnson from time to time. Hmm. But what's what's Theresa May doing right now? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's she like was, is she when, well when, uh, is she Boris more Johnson... liked than Boris Johnson right now? Do you think? I don't know. There's not really ever any polls on whether or not people still like her. There was a lot of so so the night that he had to resign, she was uh, there was footage of her dancing in a very strange, robotic, slightly undead way uh, at a big festival. And so then, normal for her. <laughs> So very normal for her, yeah. And then, uh, and then uh, his last prime minister's questions, which is supposedly when he's meant to answer questions, but never does. Um, everyone, all the conservatives gave him a round of applause, apart from Theresa May, who stayed sat down. And across social media, people were like, yeah, Theresa May, completely forgetting that she was also an awful prime minister and did many horrendous things. But so, I, but I think it, the you know the, one of the, the so this is something I joke about, right? But the Conservative Party have an incredible ability to always replace a prime minister or a leader that you absolutely hate and think is the worst person somehow with someone that's worse than them. And I don't know how they manage it, right? But every time David Cameron was awful and we're like, ah, well, at least he's gone. Oh no, it's Theresa May. She's actually somehow being worse on all the Brexit stuff and all the kind of anti-immigration and she's being worse. Oh, at least she's gone. Now, ah, it's Boris Johnson. How is he? And now he's finally gone, who has arguably been one of the worst prime ministers we've ever had for, for, you know, in terms of, in terms of economics, in terms of how society's going, in terms of just, like life expectancy has dropped under his leadership in this country but now it looks like we're either going to get rishi sunak or liz truss and neither of those options are anywhere near even being fine they're both terrible okay i just need to pull up the date the person name here and i apologize i just i had it here two seconds ago so i want to play a hypothetical for you here for a second Mm -hmm. there were eight candidates on the first ballot 
And by the last ballot, Rishi Sunak was still in the lead with MP endorsements. He had 137 MP endorsements, or yeah, no, sorry, 118 MP endorsements. And second place was a woman by the name of Penny Mordaunt, if I, if I pronounce that right here. Explain to me in a hypothetical situation where we would be if Penny Mordaunt beat Liz Truss on that fifth ballot. Would more people be going to Penny? Because we talk about how the populism side of the wing is sort of with, uh, uh, they're battling over the populism of the conservative movement. Is Penny Mordaunt still in that same category or would she have been more of a uh, centrist conservative? Because I don't know who she is. Uh, I tried to do some research. I couldn't find a lot of her campaign or <laughs> what she stands for. It, I, so um, I like the way you pronounce her name. Makes it, I, we just say Penny Mordant, which is nowhere near as nice. Penny Mordant sounds much fancier, <laughs> doesn't it? I like it. It's much better. It's much nicer. Um, so don't don't she, get me so started really, with Tom Tugan, Tugendat? Tugendhat? Tom Tugendhat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> but, um, I, know, but, I know. But anyway, Penny. So, so she was in all the polling up to the kind of final two, the most popular with conservative members. So conservative members, I think had she been the final two, Penny Morden would have beaten anyone she was up against. Right. Um, but then she went out. And so it's, is Liz Truss. They seem to be very anti Rishi Sunak. I would, you know, I wouldn't like to say why, um, but Penny Morden is, I, I mean, like, you know, again, I'm laying my cards on the table. I think she's pretty awful. She lied about being, she she constantly says she's a, and was in the Navy and, and the Navy have repeatedly said, no, you weren't. You never, you're like in the reserve. You've never done anything with us. She, she lies a lot. And she, again, is, she backs some pretty hard policies. But in terms of image, she had nothing really to do with Boris Johnson's government. She would seem like a clean new candidate. She seems quite straight laced. She's been quite good at, well, she was up until some of the debates quite good at not saying really ridiculous things. She sort of fell apart a bit out in public. But it would have been a really smart choice because what the Conservative Party, if they want to survive the next I election, which uh, is looking very, very unlikely, even though Labour are not providing any opposition and are being really rubbish. We'll talk about them in a few seconds. Like the Conservatives are going to win. Yeah, but the but but the way they would have I think would have worked for them uh, is that they they would have got a candidate that hadn't had any association with all the things that people are angry about, right? They don't really know her. They it, it would have been a fresh face, suppose you know she's not really, but would have been a fresh face for a lot of people, and um and she seems quite sensible and she had a really cheesy campaign, but it was all about celebrating Britain for what it is, and it was all very traditionalist and, and it appeals to a lot of people. So the fact they knocked her out. And apparently there were a lot of um, plans internally that kind of helped her get knocked out because uh, some of the higher up kind of MPs and people didn't really want her involved. They all want a trust. I think, you know, everyone's sort of back in trust. But yeah, it would. I think it would have looked quite different. At the same time, I, I can't imagine she'd have particularly handled any of the crises any better than any of the others when it came down to it. Um, but, you know, I think it would have been better for the Conservatives, definitely. Now, in January, you, you openly admitted that you're a Labour supporter. You support you have supported the Labour Party in past elections. Um, so I'm going to ask a hypothetical, another hypothetical question here. But there's a lot of swing voters in Canada, and I'm assuming there's a lot of swing voters in the United Kingdom as well, because you talk about that red wall going into the Conservatives, now going back into the potential Labour vote in the next election. Is there was there a candidate on the conservative benches that could have unified the party, but also gained momentum out of the uh, poll dip that the conservatives have been in under Boris Johnson? Is there an MP? Is there even a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a conservative in the country that could have helped the conservative movement unify those party switchers and not go to Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, but stay with the conservative party? I mean, uh, in my opinion, no. <laughs> but, in, but, in, but I think, I think, arg arguably, Penny Borden probably would have been uh, better for that. Um, but I mean, it, it, you know, one of the reasons that people, or one of the reasons, I suppose, the Conservatives didn't want Boris Johnson was to resign was because they thought there was nobody suitable to replace him at all. And that was the rumor leading right up until his resignation was that they were worried there was nobody that could possibly kind of, you know. Uh, 
suitably lead the party. So, I mean, I, I as I said, I, I am. So you said I, I, I have been a Labour supporter in the past. I'm not at all anymore, and I, I wouldn't. Uh, I'm very divided about how. Well, I say I'm not divided. I think they're rubbish. <laughs> but, but generally, I, I am. I am left wing because I am a left wing. Uh, so I, you know, that's that's the policy I'd like to see. But so, in my opinion, about whether there's conservative, I, I'd say there isn't because I don't think any of them are, uh, are good. But but there doesn't even, you know, sort of joking aside, there doesn't even seem to be anyone that's particularly sensible. Everyone's really it's really tribal and everyone in the last few years has been willing to go along with everything that we know have been it's a bit like the republicans in the us where they've just absolutely backed all the lies that have been proven to be lies the facts have come out and proved that this is lies i mean brexit for example brexit is definitely going badly right we've seen it at the queues at the ports of dover we've seen it at the way in which it's cost we've got we're understaffed in so many areas that need to be staffed of with uh you know it's costing us thousands uh per family that compared to what it would have been and and yet there is still this um constant thing on uh, from conservative members in particular it's going it's great it's going ahead it's brilliant we we're glad we got it done and they've all backed that every single person in it has backed they all said that he shouldn't resign over party gate they all said uh that brexit is going great you know they've backed all of this and so there isn't anybody that's just straight laced enough until i mean tom tuggenhat in the leadership election suddenly decided that he was and he'd been doing it a little bit over the years but he decided that actually all of it had been terrible um but even then you think yeah but you stayed in the party didn't you You didn't you know it's only now you're really angry i sort of can't i don't you know it's been very interesting we've had a um a slightly changed tangent here but we've had a a big union leader here um who is part of the rmt union who's who they support all the railway workers so not the drivers but they support all the managers and train staff and all the people who do the security and check everything's safe and you know trains don't run off the rails and and they're they're on strike at the moment because they're having a massive pay cut and forced redundancies you know and um and the union leader called mick lynch and he's brilliant but he's been coming on tv and just talking normally right that's that's what i say for him i mean i think he's very good but he actually just talks normally he just says this is the situation we'd all like to be able to feed our families we'd all like to be able to pay our bills they're not negotiating this and he's talking normally and pete his popularity has gone through the roof because people are going oh my goodness someone that talks honestly like a human being and it's making the politicians look terrible because they can't every time he's questioning with them they can't do anything but kind of throw out slogans and you know the same phrases it's 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 really interesting to see really interesting to see i want to pick up on what a statement that you just said there about uh the u.s style of politics that is becoming more uh apparent in the uk politics with uh fake news alternative facts whatever you want to call it um when did that start? Did that start before Boris Johnson or has that started just recently with the last COVID-19 and in the last year or so? When do you think the change from, and I, and I say sensible politics because I remember watching, like I stayed up until three o'clock at night, some nights watching UK election results. I remember watching the Tony Blair election results. I remember watching it again in 2021. I remember watching the 2010 Gordon Brown fiasco of I'm going to stay on as prime minister, but David Cameron and Nick Clegg are being BFFs and I'm not going to be prime minister anymore. And I'm going to pout and cry and go off in my own little limousine and all that <laughs> stuff. So when did it start? When did the politics of the U.S. start entering into the conservative politics, but also the larger image of U.K. politics? I mean, it's definitely I think I think what it really came in force through the Brexit campaign. Right. That's when it started was the kind of the campaign to leave the European Union. The leave campaigns really started using U.S. politics in that really big lies, really big publicity, lots and lots of online campaigns that were specifically targeted, um, targeting people that were angry about immigration, targeting people. Um, that were worried that Turkey might join the EU and we wouldn't have a say and all these kind of absolute lies that then turned out to be completely untrue uh, years down the line. But I mean, really, it's been happening since since way before that. You know, we had in, um, oh gosh, now I'm going to get pulled up on my facts here. I believe it was 2011. We had a vote, um, a referendum about changing the way in which we vote in our general election. So it was called the alternative vote. We had uh, the AV vote, um, which wasn't quite... Um, it, it, yeah, I'm trying to remember. It was a really complicated system because people would be not. There are a lot of people who would like proportional representation in our system here, and that it, AV wasn't that. It was somewhere weirdly in between. Um, but the campaign against it was so vicious 
and and again big billboards everywhere there was a i remember there being a billboard with like a a baby in an incubator on it and saying if you vote for av then this baby will die and it's like, i don't think that's i don't think that's how it works you know but it was that sort of that started out then and a lot of the campaigns that worked on brexit did work on the no to av campaign then um a lot of the sort of groups that funded it um funded that too and then we've seen that kind of grow and grow um and you know we had parties like ukip who are the uk independence party with with a just one of the worst people in the world, Nigel Farage. I was trying to be more partisan, sorry, non-partisan. But Nigel Farage, one of the worst people. We don't he, invite he you to be on partisan. We don't invite you to come on being partisan. <laughs> oh, we invite him. for the reality. Like a... Good, good. He's just absolutely, he's a horrendous froggy grifter. I hate it. I hate everything about him and his face. But he but he, he, he was part of UK and he was all about populist politics. He was, you know, being mates with, with Trump for years, you know, and 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 the republic you know that kind of side of, of populist u.s politics so he really brought it in and the, and the conservatives kind of fell into the trap of they started losing voters to ukip and so started taking on what ukip were doing to fund them and it, and i think it just kind of snowballed from there really so it's been it's been years in the making now i uh, we're, we're wrapping up here and i want to ask about one last party that there were actually two last parties but we're going to combine them here um you said you're disillusioned with the Labour Party right now. Keir Starmer is the current leader. You think he'd be out there left, right and centre, going to every single news outlet, going to every single event to try and uh, raise the Labour Party brand. But uh, yet again, outsider's perspective, I'm not seeing that. What's happening with the Labour <laughs> Labour Party right now? Like, is the Labour Party just waiting to see who their next challenger is and just hoping for the best or... Is there actually things going on and just the the media with the Guardian, the Sun and all that, the Telegraph, not reporting on what Keir Starmer is doing? I mean, inside this perspective, I'm also not seeing that either. So, <laughs> um, no, it's uh, <laughs> no, he's he's nowhere to be seen at the moment, the leader of the Labour Party. And he's also been like he's been anti strikes. He fired uh, one of his uh, main cabinet for going on one of the strikes with the workers being on the picket line, which is bizarre for Labour meant to be the workers party. And they, they've always been supported by that. But he's so keen to take the image away from that in the hope of getting conservative voters to vote for them again, um, even though they're driving away all their traditional voters. Uh, so I don't really it's a really bizarre plan. But also none of their ideas of how to fix our energy crisis or our economic crisis, none of them are um particularly radical or, or that different really to what the conservatives are pledging um and and there's also been a big report that finally came out and this hasn't been reported very much but it's called the ford report and it was a report that's been in long in the making about racism within the party particularly sort of um under uh, corbyn like, right minority members yeah well it was no so that was uh it it, it took place well it started it was for sort of the years of corbyn and onwards um but it was it wasn't specifically about like the anti-Semitism. That was a different report. This is about racism towards other members of the party, and the report's taken ages to come out. But it it's basically highlighted that some high members of Labour HQ who who are very anti-Corbyn, and there's a whole. I mean, gosh, this gets very messy. We need like another hour to get into that. But they were people who were actively working against their own party because they didn't want Corbyn in. It's all so childish, right? And um, and and there's a lot, and the report came out and basically said there's inherent racism in Labour. There's inherent racism, especially against black people, especially against um, Muslim people. There's a lot of Islamophobia. And Starmer said nothing. They've just sort of pretended it hasn't happened, which is bizarre because it's the exact opposite of his big stance against racism when it was anti-Semitism against the former leader. And he, but now he's completely silent. So it's, it's very hypocritical. Um, and a lot of members of the Labour Party are very worried about it. They, they're they not sure they want to stay in a party that doesn't try and tackle that. So you've got all these internal conflicts and he's nowhere to be seen. It's it's really useless. Not, I genuinely think his plan is to just do nothing and hope that the Conservatives collapse enough that they'll get to power easily without having to do anything. But I mean, all of his all of the things that he promised to as Labour leader, he's gone back on every single one of his pledges uh, and his promises. He said that he won't do any of the things that he, you know, said that he would do if he became Labour leader. So it's... Yeah, again, it's, it's, I mean, it's, this is what I find very hard in that, you know, we didn't, I, I can't stand the Conservatives for a lot of reasons, but they're liars and they've been liars for years. And that's a big reason that I wouldn't ever go anywhere near them. But now Labour are also liars. They're also heading, they're mainly playing to donors. They're mainly going against all the things that made them an opposition party. And if you haven't got 
you know, an opposition at the very least, whether you support the politics or not, should be an opposition. They should be the opposite. That's what you want. You need to you, it'd be nice to have a choice in the country. <laughs> but there isn't really one. You are asking anyway. way too much of po d uh, democracy and politics here, Darren. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I know. You're asking know. way too much here. What um, an idiot. What a naive idiot. I, I want to leave on this because this is going to be a month of fun excitement. And for those who don't listen to the partly political <laughs> broadcast, um, you are off for the month of August. You're not back until uh, middle of uh, um, uh, September after potentially after the uh, vote. Go ahead. No, okay, gonna, I'll come back for the vote. I'm going to come back for early September. Okay, so we're going to get an I episode. Not, right? Yeah. Well, you could. You could. You just you, you're choosing to. <laughs> If you were a betting man right now, if you had to put money on it, who would win this race right now? Would it be Sunak or would it be Trust and why? I think I think it's going to be Liz Trust, and it, it's and I said it, you know, she's she's ahead in all the polls, and I said it before, and and I I wish it, uh, you know, may, maybe there are more complicated reasons, but genuinely I think it's because a lot of traditional conservative voters don't like the idea of an Asian man in charge. And uh, that's what we'd have. We'd have our first ever Asian prime minister, um, which, which is possibly one one of the, the very few positives of, if Rishi Sunak got in, but we would. And I think that there is uh, considerable anger about that idea, especially as, as I mentioned before, conservatives did take on a lot of UKIP voters uh, who are now some of their membership and UKIP were very strongly anti-immigration, very strongly. There's, there's a lot of real nationalism uh, that, that came from that party. And I think the idea of an Asian prime minister is absolutely not what they want in any way. So I think I think that'll be what pips it. But I think also, yeah, because she continues the Boris legacy. Uh, and, and at the moment, everything is pointing to her being our prime minister. Um, so unless something really changes, I don't know, like she falls in a well and can't get out. I don't know what it would have to be to really change the result right now. But that, that might be it. Yeah. <laughs> On July 25th, uh, the, your last episode before the, your little uh, break here, you, you mentioned that watching a debate between Tress and Sunak is like basically putting a bunch of bees in your eyes, if I'm not mistaken. I'm <laughs> paraphrasing here. There's a lot of voters, uh, a lot of uh, uh, UK residents who are like you right now, who are thinking the worst, the best of the worst is what we're getting here is, or the worst of the worst is what we're getting here. Do you have hope? Do you have any hope that the next prime minister could potentially fix some of the issues or are you expecting it to be the same that we started in 2022 and it's going to end in 2022, the exact same thing, but a different person in charge? Yeah, give, think, give me think, some uh, give me some hope. Same. <laughs> well, he, I'll tell you where my hope is, right? Because I don't have any hope that, that anything's going to change in terms of the pol politics leadership. I think they're going to be forced to put more support for people. I don't think they're going to have a choice because I think I, my hope is that it really feels like people are going to stand up. I, I, I mean, it's been a long, long time coming and we're particularly bad at protest, especially when you look at like France and other places like that that are so much better than us. But people are so angry right now. People are so worried and so angry about being able to afford to heat their homes in winter, being able to afford to eat. Um, this is now affecting, they reckon over 50% of people will be forced into some sort of poverty by winter because of our increase in, in bills, fuel poverty, um, wages going down. And I don't think the Conservatives can let that slide. I think, I think there's either going to be an uproar <laughs> or or they're going to have to back down and change something and so my my optimism is in is in people i think for the first i haven't been able to say that for years but i genuinely think uh, the british public are going to stand up to the or, or break something's going to break uh, i think before before the concerns about you do anything remotely positive to uh to fend it off I read a, a, a news article in The Guardian this morning because in, pre in preparation for this, just in case there was something major changed in the leadership race. <laughs> and I just read, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, the issue around the uh, electrical grid and the power situation in the UK is so dire right now that come winter, they're looking at potentially shutting down libraries, shutting down railways mm -hmm. to conserve energy to offset what people will need to heat their houses uh work like work on their day-to-day -day lives I, I and I, I mean this with all respect uh, to the people of the uk what the fuck's going on here like it, 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 <laughs> you because don't need to, you don't need to have respect in there that's fine um i'm a member of the commonwealth i have respect for my motherland <laughs> 
Um, but, but you know, it, it, this is this is all things. So in 2015, the Conservatives stopped the funding uh, towards renewable energy sources. We were meant to have a tidal power station in Wales that would provide a good ton of energy. We were meant to have more wind farms. They stopped all that. They cut that off. They, that was part of their cuts. Um, you know, we sold off all our energy elsewhere. We have to. We send gas to France, I believe, uh, by a big pipe, and then we buy it back from France at more than double the price um, because it's all private privatized so the this is all of the governments of past making you know um and current governments making and it's it's all crashing down and and you know it's it's uh yeah i mean for, for all the kind of beliefs in a free market and, and capitalist society it's really not working right now um and none of it none of it's working and, and that's what we're leading to is yeah blackouts in january uh, or everything having to close to avoid it and and meanwhile people won't be able to afford their electricity if they do have it in their homes so I, it's all looking really, really chaotic. And that's why I'm saying that I think this is the first time in a long time where I feel like the general opinion of, of people that you're out and about when you talk to people. Uh, I've been like doing, you know, my, my job is a stand-up comedian. I've been out and about at festivals and generally uh, people everywhere are very worried and scared. And I think that's when, when the public, when that much of the public is that wor is worried, that's when things have to change, I think. I hope. I really hope. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? It'd be nice to have a change for Christmas. That's all I want. <laughs> Do you expect an election to be called soon? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I can't work it out because I think either the Conservatives will be, they're quite low in the polls and they'll either realise they're low in the polls and they don't have to call one. They don't have to call one. Uh, Boris Johnson got rid of the five-year term thing so they can kind of call one when they want um so i can't work out if the new leader it might be like trust where she's such, got such an ego she wants to prove that she can win an election she might just call one um or if they're gonna i say this they don't do anything sensible the sensible thing for them would be not to but you know who knows they're just so ridiculous uh, it's so hard to know how much of this is malicious and how much of it is incompetence or if it's malicious incompetence and it's really hard to tell with anything they do uh, if they're just really stupid or not. I don't know. I can't tell you. So, <laughs> so that's where we'll leave the interview of Tiernan Collins and the conservative <laughs> movement. Stupid. <laughs> but yeah, yep, thank very you so proud of that. <laughs> thank you so much for this. This is, I, I'm always happy to have you on the show to talk about this type of stuff because I educate myself a little bit because I get to learn from someone who's actually on the ground doing this, but also I get to educate my listeners and from coast to coast to coast, my Canadian listeners and followers. Thank you so much for appearing on the show of the cross border interviews. Thanks tons for having me again. It's been a pleasure. Uh, so with that, I want to remind everyone, uh, get out from behind social media for at least five minutes a day. Go have a conversation with somebody. You would be surprised how well our democracy and our society changes when people actually talk to each other instead of yelling at the abyss of Twitter. So with that, uh, for those who want to follow Tiernan and his show notes are in the uh, show notes, scroll down, click on Twitter, click on Instagram, but also click on his uh, partly political broadcast. Uh, it's coming back in a few weeks. So check it out because you will not want to miss that because it, it, as much as we've laughed today, he is a uh, like a show of epic laughs because every time I see a new episode, I'm laughing my ass off for the first like hour. So with that, thanks everyone for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone, keep talking.